Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here on this great celebration day where we emphasize the power of the resurrection of Jesus. And let's pray as we come to God's word here this morning. Father, we do want to thank you so very much for the victory that this day promises and brings to our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the pledge of your power operating in us, for the reality of the risen Lord in our lives. Thank you that you are powerful and mighty and awesome, and we pray that as we come to your word this morning, Lord, we just ask that you would let your Holy Spirit take these truths, burn them into our hearts and lives, Lord, in a whole fresh way. And Father, we just give you the thanks and the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, it's such a privilege to be able to share about the resurrection of Jesus this morning. So thankful to God for another opportunity to highlight the great victory of the Lord Jesus. This morning, we're going to be sharing about he is not here, he is risen. And, you know, there are a lot of paradoxes in the life of Jesus. Um, he noted in Matthew's gospel that Jesus experienced hunger, but he fed others. He noted in Matthew's gospel that Jesus grew weary, but he gave rest to others. Although he was the king, the Messiah, he paid tribute. He was called the devil, but he cast out demons. He died the death of a sinner, but he came to save his people from their sins. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, but he gave his life a ransom for many. He who would not turn stones to bread for himself gave his own body as bread for those who follow him. But nowhere is the irony that was present in the life of Jesus more pervasive than in his death. His enemies believed they were destroying him, but little did they understand that the destruction they achieved was God's mean of redemption for a fallen world. Messiah's enemies thought they had inflicted the ultimate defeat, but in God's providence, that defeat was the Messiah's greatest triumph. Don't you just love him? How can you help but love him? And uh, we live a life of gratitude. So I'd like to turn to Matthew's gospel, and we're going to be turning to Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, where we will uh, begin uh, with the time of the crucifixion. And it says in Matthew's gospel, verse, chapter 27, verse 45, now from the sixth hour darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there when they heard it began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran. Taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And verse 51, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When we think about the power that Jesus had. His hands are nailed. His side is about to be pierced. As he hangs there, he cannot protect himself from the insults of those who are looking on. But in the moment of his utmost weakness, 
He is so strong that he rends the veil of the temple from top to bottom. At 3 p.m., the Passover lambs were being slain. Attendants would be in the holy place, tending to the things inside of there, when the huge veil was torn from top to bottom. It's a new and living way into the presence of the Lord. It's a sign that salvation has been accomplished. Forgiveness has been extended. A right relationship with God is possible, and we can come into the presence of the Lord. Donna Duke last week said to me, you know, there's another way of looking at that veil being torn too. God's saying, I'm coming out. <laughs> I like that too. I'm coming out. I'm moving towards you. You know, we move towards him and he moves towards us. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated through, uh, for us through the veil, his flesh. Hebrews 10, 21. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere faith in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You know, if we can't see the faithfulness of God to keeping his promise in the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection, uh, we need someone to help us wake up. It looked completely impossible that he would come back from the dead. It looked completely impossible that he could have been telling the truth that on the third day he would rise again. But do you know, there was never a doubt in his mind and he did exactly what he said he would do. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. You know, sometimes in life, we, hope is hard to come by. We come up against circumstances that are very hard, very difficult, very challenging. They challenge us to the core of who we are. And sometimes we wonder, is there hope? But the Bible says here, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And you can look at the circumstances in your life that just look completely impossible. You can look at the circumstances in your life that you have waited so long and you haven't had that answer to your prayers yet. And hold fast the confession of your hope because you have a living Savior who cares about you. So he says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing. And coming back to Matthew's gospel, I'd like to highlight some of these uh, verses here about after uh, Verse 51, it tells us here, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And then it tells us that the earth shook. The immovable was stirred by the death of Christ. And it tells us again, it highlights the unbelievable power of, of the Savior. He did not touch the earth. He was crucified upon a tree. His hands were immobilized by what was happening to him upon the cross. He was dying, but in his act of death, he made the earth beneath him quake. Wow. The rocks were split. So the veil of the temple was torn. The earth shook. The rocks were split. This is a little bit of a different thing than uh, the earth shaking. And as Jesus died, it's almost as if, as his soul was being rent from his body, the veil of the temple was rent in two, and the earth was rent, torn apart, rent in gulfs and chasms. This is a little different than the earthquake. There's actual chasms being formed here. 
by the movement of the earth, when Christ shouts, it is finished. The tombs were open, verse 52, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. You know, uh, I love the country of Nepal. Thankful I had a chance to be there. But when you see videos of the earthquake that happened there some years ago, or if you saw it on the news, you would find that an earthquake brings unmitigated destruction everywhere. But do you know this rending of the earth was singular in what it caused to happen? And this could only be the hand of God. This rending of the earth opened the tombs of many of the saints. It had a singular focus. It had a singular purpose, opening the tombs. And many bodies of the saints were raised. Life was imparted to them. And isn't that, isn't that the miracle work of the cross that I who am dead in my sins and trespasses, come alive because of what Jesus accomplished upon that cross. It's the wondrous work of the cross that by the death of our Lord, regeneration comes to men. If it were not for that one death, there would be no new birth. If Jesus had not died, we could not live forever in eternity with him. If he had not bowed his head, None of us could have lifted our heads and said, God is our Father. If he had not there on the cross passed from among the living, we must have remained among those lost forever and ever and ever. Verse 53 continues the story. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? This chasming of the earth with this singular focus of opening graves happens when he dies. But they don't come out of those tombs until after he rose from the dead. What were they doing those three days? You know, were they, they were probably worshiping. They were probably, you know, who, I don't know what they were doing. But, you know, after three days, they come out and, and they make their way towards the holy city. Do you know, when you have experienced the power of the cross, one thing is very important to you. You want to make your way towards holiness. You want to make your way. Uh, th they left their tombs to be among the holy. They longed to join themselves to God's people. They wanted to be in God's house. They want to get to that holy city. They come out of the tombs. I had a friend when I was in Bible college who was from Korea, and he actually was an orphan who lived in the caves because his family were killed in the war. And as a little orphan boy, he lived in a cave with a bunch of other orphans, and they would come down and steal and pickpocket and things like that to live, and then they'd go back up into the cave. and. A, Missionary have kept going up into the cave and they scorned him, they hated him, they couldn't figure out, they didn't want anything to do with him. But he kept going up and telling these kids about Jesus. And one day it started to make sense. He wanted to give his life to Christ and asked the missionary, what do I have to do? And the missionary said, you have to leave your cave and you have to come and live with me. And what a, what a wonderful picture of salvation. You have to leave your cave. You know, if you come alive, you, you can't stay where you were before. You, you're someone else now. You've got to live somewhere else. You can't live where you used to live. You can't do what you used to do. They made their way toward the holy city. Uh, something in them aspired to, to want to do better, to live above where they used to live. And this young guy, um, he told me that when he went to live the missionary's house, he was so filthy that they took a hose, like a fire hose, 
and washed him down <laughs> before they let him in. <laughs> He'd just been this kid living in this cave for all these times. He didn't even know his name. They, uh, he didn't know how old he was, when his birthday was. All those things were destroyed during the Korean War. So they gave him the name of his sister, the government, when they were trying to figure out who he was. And uh, that was his life. We were in the lunch line, and we had hot dogs. He'd never seen a hot dog before. So he says, what are those? I said, oh, those are hot dogs. He says, in this country? <laughs> I said, not that kind of hot dog. <laughs> Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. You, know, you can let your mind go a little bit with this one. I just have to wonder if John the Baptist reheaded, appeared to Herod. <laughs> if I was John, I would want to. I would just leave it at that. <laughs> But they appeared to many. You know, they didn't hide the truth of what God had done in their lives. He brought them back for a reason. They had a message to bring. And if you know that your sins have been forgiven by Jesus, you have something to say. And people need you to make an appearance in their lives. Verse 54. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, truly, this was the Son of God. I can imagine they were frightened. I mean, it was so obvious that supernatural things that are unexplainable by any other means than the Bible were taking place. And when you realize how huge and vast God is and how small we are, it can be a little overwhelming and frightening seeing things happening that had no explanation in the natural. God was doing something and nothing could prevent him. That was very obvious. Matthew 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. You know, the grave is not what it used to be for the believer. The grave is no longer a place for sorrow for the believer in Jesus Christ, but it's the passage to eternal life where we put off this life and put on the new life and be with the Lord. You know, these women, they wanted to come down and look at this grave and there were three difficulties that they would have. I mean, they didn't know that the grave had been opened when they came. But there were three difficulties that they had no idea how they were going to solve. And one is that the stone itself was huge. And it was stamped with the seal of Roman law as a second thing. And it was guarded by soldiers representative of the power of Rome as the third thing. But, you know, you don't have to have all the answers when you set off to follow the Lord. You don't have to have it all figured out. They, their love made them go because they just had to see what they thought would be his grave and possibly to uh, get inside that grave to uh, further help the body along. But you know, there are the same kind of difficulties that we face. Death itself is a huge stone that no human being can move aside. It's too big. Death is a penalty that God required for offenses against his law. The seal of his law was the soul that sins shall die. How can it be removed? The red seal of God's wrath against sin was on that death. Who could roll that stone away? 
Verse 2, behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord had descended from heaven and came and rolled away the, t- the stone and sat on it. A couple years ago, I, I just had a, a thought that I'd never had before about these two earthquakes. You know, all my life I'd read that there was an earthquake at the crucifixion and there was an earthquake at the resurrection, but it never really hit me that these were like three days apart from another. And one is at the crucifixion and one is at the resurrection. I'm like, Lord, what does this even mean? What is the symbolism of this? How significant is it? And it's just like I, I feel... You know, I I can't back this up from scripture or anything, but I think it has to be true that when Christ died and forgave our sins, boom, the chain of sin was broken from the world. And when Christ came back to life inside that cave, he was resurrected, boom, the chain of sin and death and hell, the chain of death and hell were broken. And it just resounded in the natural from what had taken place in the spiritual. As we look at that moved stone with the angel sitting on it, it rises before us as a monument of Christ's victory over death and hell. A severe earthquake had occurred for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. What would you have thought if you were those soldiers? They were terrified. In fact, verse 3 says, his appearance was like lightning. His clothing was white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The earth shook and the guards shook, you know. Yet we need to remember that this victory was achieved for us and the fruits of it are ours. The Bible says he rose again for our justification. And if he had not fully paid the debt, he would have remained in the grave. If Jesus had not made a total, effectual, final atonement, He would not have rose again, but he did. And I love that that stone, the angel sat on that stone. There's a sense in which it became a place of rest as that angel sat on it. And while I do my best to honor God and to serve God, I I do my best to live the life he wants me to live. That's not the basis that I will get into heaven for. I rest on something far more powerful than my own life. I rest on something far more powerful than the degree of lordship that is in my life. I rest upon his finished work. And as that angel rested upon that tomb, rolled that stone away, you know, uh, the angel was not intimidated by the soldiers. And the angel didn't say, uh, pardon me, would you mind if I move this stone aside? You know, I I don't mean to mess with you and your job. The angel came down, boom, there was an earthquake. He rolled the stone away, sat on that stone. Boom, (laughs) the guards go down. In fact, they were slain in the spirit. They were like dead men. Love it. The guards shook for him. And there's so much, there's so many layers of meaning. The angel said in verse 5, Don't be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he was laying. It was a divine validation. The angel rolling away the stone, announcing the resurrection, is a divine vindication of Christ's victory over death. The angel's message that Jesus had risen just as he said underscores the reliability of Jesus' words and the fulfillment of God's promise. 
I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified, but he is not here for he is risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he was lying. Have you ever thought it was over for you? They thought it was over. They, they took what their eyes literally saw, which was the one they had followed and believed in being marred more than any man. You know, it's no wonder that people didn't recognize him. I mean, the last time they saw him, he was a bloody mess. His skin was torn from his body. His beard was pulled out of his face. That's the last time they saw him. And when he rose from the dead, all that was healed. There's only a couple things that still remain, and that's the scars in his hands and his feet. All eternity will look at him and know that's the only reason we're there. You know, we do our best to live the life God wants us to live. We do our best to follow the scriptures and apply the morality and the spirituality of the Bible. But that's not what we rest on. We rest on an empty tomb. Because we'll never measure up. The good news is we don't have to. Oh, we do our best. We want to learn. We want to grow. We want to honor him. But that's not what we rest on. He did it. He did it for us. And these women, they, they thought that it was all over. The heel, his heel was bruised by the serpent at the crucifixion, but on resurrection morning, he crushed the serpent's head. What a victory. When we see the place, come and see the place where he was lying. When we, when we think about the place where he was lying, we see that the Father did not forsake Jesus. When we see the place where they laid him, we see that death is conquered. When we see the place that they laid him, we see that we have a living Savior, a living friend in Jesus, that he's alive. And there's hope. In every hopeless circumstance, there's hope. See, they, they looked with their eyes and they saw what no one had ever in the whole history of humanity, no one had ever escaped death in that way by coming back from the dead. Death reigned until Christ rose again. It reigned. And they looked at him, they saw him asphyxiate. and they had no hope. But I just want to tell you, whatever your battles are, whatever your struggles are, whatever you find it hard to believe, God is interested in, in your life. There's always hope. The darkest circumstances can become the gateway to the most unbelievable miracles because we have a risen Lord. Verse seven, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going ahead of you into Galilee and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. You know, sometimes his disciples need reminded that he's risen from the dead. I'm one of his disciples. Sometimes I need reminded that he's risen from the dead. How about you? So go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. Behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Luke's gospel adds another kind of layer to this, and it says this in Luke 24, 10 through 12. Now, they were... Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. 
but the words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. The words appeared to them as nonsense. They, they couldn't believe them. They would not believe in them. But then they had to experience it for themselves. And they did. John chapter 20, verse 12 says, And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been laying. I think this is one of the most profound uh, details that we're told in the word of God about the resurrection of Jesus. They go into that empty tomb. It's a slab that's laying there. And at the head and at the foot of that slab is, are two angels. Well, that is a 100% representative of the Ark of the Covenant. Where in the Ark of the Covenant, where the blood was brought once a year and sprinkled on that mercy seat. There was an angel at the head and there was an angel at the foot. And even though this was not literally the mercy seat, do you know for us it absolutely 100% is? This is where we find mercy. This is why we can find forgiveness because Jesus took our place. He died for the sins that we committed. And we come to him, we have mercy that's extended to us from God. Mercy is something you don't deserve. You don't earn it, but it's given to you. And he gives us this mercy. Two angels in white sitting, one at the head, one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been laying. Peter saw the linen wrappings and went home marveling at what would happen. Well, what's so marvelous about linen wrappings? Linen wrappings that you were wrapped with in a grave held their form. <laughs> it was the, they were in the shape of a body, but the body wasn't there. It wasn't like Jesus rose from the dead and said, well, I guess I better unwind all this. I mean, he just walked out of all that. And it was stiff. It was there. And he marveled. He was confused, you know, up until that point. In verse 8, they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. You know... We all have challenges in our life. When we really believe that the risen Jesus is interested in our lives and present in our lives, even in the face of your challenges, you have to choose joy. You choose it. And these people had great joy. We face some pretty big challenges in our lives. But when I come back to the truth, the risen Lord is present in our lives. Great joy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that it it isn't what it looks like. Just like the cross wasn't what it looked like. It looked like the end. It was a new beginning. Thank you, Lord, that I have your presence with me. Even in my trials and in my difficulties, I can get beyond me and know that you are here. And getting beyond us is a really big thing to having great joy that he's alive. They left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. You know, they had a different kind of fear than the centurion had and a different kind of fear that the guards had. The guards and the centurion should be afraid because they were messing with God. It doesn't go well when you mess with God. 
But this fear was an awe and an amazement of the greatness of our God. They left with fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. They, they ran to report it to him. They were so excited about what they had discovered, they had to let other people know. Yeah, we can ask ourselves a question. Do we consider it such an amazing event that we're running to tell anybody? Or are we just happy to keep it to ourselves? We need to find ways to run and tell people. He's real. And this whole thing has consequences. We got to get right with him. He made a way. There's a mercy seat. Forgiveness of sin is available. You can come out of darkness into light. You know, God, give us a, more of an evangelistic heart and an attitude. They ran, left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, came to ran to report it to his disciples. Verse 9, and behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Jesus said to them, verse 10, do not be afraid. Go and take my word to my brethren to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. And we're gonna drop down to verse 16. Verse 16 says, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some were doubtful. That word, Doubtful means a state of uncertainty and hesitation. Have you ever wavered in wondering if he's with you? Most of us have somewhere along the line. These disciples had more reason than we because the last time they had seen him, it was impossible. He was being buried and people don't come back from the dead prior to this. Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Wow. Remember what Pilate wrote on the cross? This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. How about, this is Jesus, the king of the universe. All authority in, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Do, you, do we really realize who it is that saved us? He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Whoa. He's not just the king of the Jews. He's the king of the universe. And he has that authority. And he says uh, to them, well, he's no more a mediator. He's no more a sufferer, but he's a sovereign. He's no longer a victim. He's a victor. He's no longer a servant. He's the monarch of earth and heaven. All power has been given to him. He stooped to conquer. Do you know, in the way God does things, he doesn't do things like we do things a lot of the time. In God's way of looking at things, if you want to go up, you got to go down. You want to go up and you just try to get up, he says, be my guest. Jesus took on the form of a servant that he might become Lord of all. And that's a good model for all of us. The way up is actually the way down. And that's our Lord. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you know in those four, those couple sentences there, do you know there are four alls associated with the Great Commission? All authority, all nations, all things that I have taught you, and all ways. Those are the four things, the four alls that are connected with the Great Commission. We have to know that he is in charge and that all nations need to be reached with the gospel. And we're to take the things that he taught, especially in the gospels in the New Testament, all things that he taught, and to know that he is with us always. If we really lived like that were true, we would have so much less stress in our lives knowing that he is with us always. Sometimes we feel, you know, forsaken. We wonder, where are you, God? If we really just had the confidence that he meant what he said, and do you know what? He means what he said. I just want to give you the assurance. If he said, in three days, I am going to rise again from the dead after the chief priests to deliver me to the Romans where, where I will be scourged and crucified and I will rise again from the dead on the third day. If he said that and it happened, I want to tell you, if he says, I am with you always, it happens. Well, do I feel him always? Well, that's not the question. Probably you don't. I don't. But it doesn't change the fact that he's with us always. That's our Lord. So he says, make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That always kind of means like day by day, I am with you. Hebrews chapter seven, verse 16 says this, he who has become such our great high priest, not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. They did their best to destroy that life, scourged, crucified, but they couldn't. It's indestructible. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Acts 2.24, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. Some of us have been through some deaths that have been agonizing for us to watch. But he put an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. An indestructible life, impossible for him to be held in its power. The creator of everything. And I'm going to ask Ed to come back up and the team. But I'm so thankful this morning that I've experienced that grace and that mercy at that mercy seat. I'm, I'm so thankful that I've been given a relationship with God through Jesus Christ that's not based on my own efforts to live the life well, although I try to live the life well. It's based on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And I'm just going to close with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 58, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a chapter that talks about the resurrection. 
And it says this, in light of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not vain in the Lord. In light of the resurrection, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. God, give us the grace and give us the ability. Give us the understanding that because you were crucified and rose again and that you've made your promise that you are with us. God, enable us to be steadfast and immovable and abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our toil is not in vain in the Lord. See, sometimes we're tempted to think our toil is in vain. We're tempted to think no one's getting it. And it is toil to serve the Lord. It's not a mental exercise. It's hands-on toil to serve the Lord. We had a daughter, but we still do. <laughs> but our daughter, at one point in her life, our younger daughter, she wanted to practice the flute as a mental exercise instead of actually toiling. <laughs> so she had a, uh, she had, we had to sign as her parents that she had done her flute practice. So she comes to us and, uh, can you sign the flute practice for me? Well, Jennifer, we didn't hear you playing the flute. She said, well, I did it in my head. <laughs> no. Serving the Lord is not a mental exercise. It, it's toil. There's things you have to literally do, and it takes effort. It takes concentration. It takes focus. And in you serve the Lord, at some point, you're not going to want to be steadfast. And at some point, you're going to be movable, and you're not going to want to abound in the work of the Lord because you think it's in vain. Well, I have good news for you. It's not. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Don't let things or circumstances push you away. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. How can you know it's not in vain? Because it's in partnership with he who rose from the dead. Isn't that amazing? It's in partnership with him. And if he's involved, it can't be in vain. You may not see the results that you would like to see, but you're not the judge of what's happened and what hasn't happened. He is. And he's alive. And he's with you. And I just want to have to tell you, you're the answer to what this world needs because you've experienced that forgiveness. You've experienced the power of the resurrection. The chain of sin has been, boom, broken in your life. And the chain of death, one day, boom, will be broken in your life and you'll live forever with him. But for now, go and tell. Find a way. Leave a tract. You know, one way that you can usually, you know, people don't always want to hear, but I didn't always want to hear. But I have, myself, I have never had a person say no to me when I've asked them if I could pray for them. It's a great way to begin to build a bridge. Right? Go and tell. 
And when we pray, the Lord shows up. So find a way, find a way to go and tell. Because what we know about him, the world needs to hear. We need to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Somehow here we don't have a great success in baptizing. Most of the people we baptize we never see again. <laughs> Somebody came and said, I want to be baptized. I'm like, go down the street. <laughs> we want to keep you here. But go and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, Father, we just want to thank you for your victory that we get to enjoy, for your salvation that, that has become the most meaningful thing in our lives. Thank you for the mercy seat, where the blood of the atonement brings forgiveness. Thank you for the reality of your presence with us here on Easter and always. Thank you that we can celebrate. Lord, help us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together and help us to be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Help us to do that, not to earn your favor, but to express our love to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I just want everyone to close your eyes for a moment. And if you are here today and you've never received the Lord as your Savior, boy, wouldn't this be a wonderful day to give your life to Jesus. If there's someone here who wants to give your life to Jesus this morning, I'd just like you to raise your hand and we'd be more than happy to pray with anybody here this morning to give your life to the Lord. I don't really see anyone's hand is up. But you know, it's always appropriate to rededicate. Yes, thank you. But I'd like to lead you in a prayer. We have a sister who's raised her hand. Could you follow me in a prayer, please? Dear Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for what you did for me. I have never felt such love and I ask you to forgive me of my sins I'm sorry Lord help me to change I receive your gift of forgiveness I receive your salvation and here this morning I give my life to you and I thank you Jesus that you receive me Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for the love that you have. Help me to get to know you better. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.